I just want you to stop and think for a minute before we get underway, a couple of thoughts. Over the three and a half years of the Lord's ministry, the Lord stayed in many different locations, ate many different meals, grew fond of many of his disciples, all right? But during the final months of his ministry, as the Lord turned his attention to his impending sacrifice and death at Jerusalem, there was one really special family that seemed to catch or have caught his attention. And that family was the little family in a house in Bethany, the family of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And whilst Christ was fond of many of his disciples, it actually says of this particular family in John chapter 11 and verse 5, that Jesus loved them. Now, it doesn't say that of many of his disciples, but it says of these three, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, that he loved them. He agapaid them, which naturally begs the question, doesn't it, brothers and sisters and young people? Why did Jesus love this family so much? What was so special about this family that meant that he stayed with them and loved them so dearly? Well, hopefully over the course of our four studies that we have in Bible class, I hope like me, you'll understand why. Because I've grown incredibly fond of these remarkable people. And whilst not much is recorded of them, what is will reveal a family like each one of us with amazing character traits, but large flaws, but whose passionate service and emotional dedication and devotion to their Lord was undeniable and will come to see this. And in this family, I'm sure we'll see ourselves linked to one of these characters. So over the course of these studies, we're going to focus mainly on Mary and Martha and briefly discuss Lazarus along the way. But the reason for why I want to do that, brothers and sisters, is because I think the record wants to paint a portrayal of these two remarkably sister, faithful sisters in contrast to one another. It's a study of contrasts in Lazarus's two sisters, two wonderful women of faith. And over our four studies, we're going to examine, well, these incidents in these, these particular ladies' life. We're going to have a look at their challenges and their moments that they show incredible faith to gain some invaluable insights into their own characters, their own flaws, their strengths and their struggles, and provide some practical insights and suggestions for each one of us as we work as an ecclesial family in service to our Lord. So we're going to look in Martha's moment of challenge and the reading that we had tonight, Luke chapter 10. And then in our second class, we're going to have a look at moment, um, Martha's moment of faith in John chapter 11 associated with Lazarus's death and resurrection. And then we're going to have a look at Mary's moment of challenge, where she falls to pieces in John chapter 11. And then finally, we want to consider Mary's moment of incredible faith in John chapter 12 and Mark chapter 14. Now, from these studies, I hope you'll appreciate, as I have, the, these remarkable women because they will help us practically immensely in our walk together as a family. So to set the scene for tonight, I think it's really helpful if we, want, if we can understand what we know from the scripture about this amazing family. Well, I think the first thing we have to notice is, is that their house became Jesus' resort whilst he was at Jerusalem at the end of his three and a half year ministry. And in the latter years, and, uh, sorry, in the latter weeks and, and days of the Lord's ministry, he focused attention particularly on Jerusalem, the temple, his disciples, as he prepared for his impending sacrifice. And in this process, rather than staying in Jerusalem itself, it would appear that the Lord chose to stay in Bethany. I want to show you that from Mark's gospel. If you come back now to Mark chapter 11, I want to show you that he deliberately chooses to not stay in Jerusalem, but chooses to stay two and a half kilometers away in Bethany. I think it's two and a half kilometers away. 3.2 k's away, actually, if I read my overheads correctly. <laughs> All right. So 3.2 k's from Jerusalem. Now, come and have a look at this. In Mark chapter 11 and verse 1 is the time when Jesus is on his way now to Jerusalem. And it says, And when they came nigh to Jerusalem, unto, Bethany, unto Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent forth two of his disciples. And so he, 
send them on their way into a village over against you and find the colt. And so they, they go and do that, and then they set him up, and he rides into Jerusalem on the ass's colt. And we know in verse 11, it says, And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple, when, when he had looked round about on all these things, and now in the even time was come, he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. And on the morrow, verse 12, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. So he stayed overnight in Bethany, not in Jerusalem. All right, and he comes back, we know, verse 15, and they come to Jerusalem. And Jesus went out and began to cast those things. So he's in the temple, cleaning out the temple. And when the even was come, says verse 19, he went out of the city. And in the morning when they came past, they saw the fig tree. So on their way back to Jerusalem, they see the fig tree. So he's stayed outside of Jerusalem. And then we come into verse 27, and it says, and they came again to Jerusalem, and he was walking in the temple. And so there's this coming and going in and out of Jerusalem. And so where did he stay? Where did he go? Well, if you keep going in the record, in Mark chapter 12, as they journey backwards and forwards in and out of the temple and in and out of Jerusalem, Mark 14 says... Verse 1, and after two days was the feast of Passover and unleavened bread, when the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might by craft put him to death, but they said not on the feast day, and being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box. So he's in the house in Bethany of Simon the leper. And when we compare the record in John chapter 12 and verse 1, we find that that particular person is Mary. The house that he's in is the house that Mary and Martha are in. So as he journeys backwards and forwards from Jerusalem to avoid the Jewish rulers and the multitudes, he resorts with his disciples to this house in Bethany. And I want you to notice it's called Simon's house. When you notice that, Mark chapter 14 and verse 3, being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, he sat at me. It's called Simon's house. But I want you to notice in the record in Simon's house, whilst he stays at their house, Simon is never mentioned of being present amongst them on any of the occurrences in this house. Simon's absent in the record. And more than this, when we were introduced to Martha in Luke chapter 10, verse 38, what did Luke chapter 10, verse 38 say about this particular house in Luke chapter 10? Well, Luke chapter 10 tells us, verse 30, 38, when he came into a certain village, a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. Her house. So on one particular occasion, or in fact, more than one occasion in John's gospel and in, Mark, in Mark's gospel, it's called Simon's house. But Simon's never mentioned. But when we're introduced to Martha, it's called her house. And what's interesting is the more we look at the story and the more we inspect the record, we find it would appear that not only was Martha living in Simon's house, but so was Mary and so was Lazarus. It appears in, from John chapter 11 that they all live together in this house. And Simon, whilst being named the owner, is what's focused on when we really look at each record is he's called Simon the leper. Simon the leper. Simon the leper. His disease is profiled the most. And he's never present amongst them on any occasion. Not even in the last supper where, uh, in the last um, time when it records that they all sat at meat and Mary anoints his feet, Simon's nowhere to be seen. And we know from Mark chapter 14, uh, Luke chapter 10 that it's called Martha's house, as opposed, by the way, to Mary or Lazarus's house. It's called Martha's house. So what conclusion might we draw from this? Well, I think the conclusion that we can draw probably most um, consistency is, is that it's, it's likely that Martha was married to Simon, that she was his wife, but that Simon developed leprosy. And his leprosy was so great that he'd become known as Simon the leper. Simon the leper, he was known in Bethany called Simon the leper by both Jews in Jerusalem and those in Bethany, but that ultimately he died 
from his disease. By the time of the records of Mark 14 and John 12. And the house and its contents had been left to the family, but particularly to Martha, who was his wife. And Martha, therefore, was probably the eldest of the three of the siblings, who had brought her family in under her roof to support her, because it would appear that Mary and Lazarus never married. All supposition, I might add, but what we can try and glean from the record. And we can think that Mary and Martha and Lazarus were older, but if the above is correct, perhaps the family was actually a little younger, more probably in their 30s rather than their 50s, more of perhaps the age of the Lord and of his disciples. So armed with this, we also notice that they were held in high reputation. When we look in John chapter 11, in verses 1 and 19, many of the Jews came to Lazarus' death in John chapter 11 to help Mary and Martha as they mourned. So they were held in very high reputation in Bethany and Jerusalem. And it would appear that they were probably a family of means. You see, it was a house that was suitable for guests, for Jesus and for his disciples. So they were both willing to feed all of them at all times when the Lord came. So they often resorted there and fed them. And we also note that when it came to an anointment, she uses not just cheap farmer's perfume, but she chooses to use an expensive perfume that was so expensive that everybody that looked at that thought it was such a waste from John chapter 12. So it would appear they were probably a family of means. That Simon had died, Mary was therefore a, a widow, perhaps that's also going to help us understand why she had a good concept of the resurrection. She was probably the eldest, that Mary and, and Lazarus lived with, Mary, with Martha in Bethany, and that they were held in very high reputation. And what we are told in John chapter 11, is, is, as I said before, is, is that Jesus loved them. Jesus loved them dearly. And so perhaps armed with this background, brothers and sisters, we can now begin to consider the character of Martha. Because as we now look at Martha, we're going to see a woman who loves to give. I want to pick up the story as we consider our topic for tonight, Martha's challenge in Luke chapter 10 and verse 38. And so it says in Luke chapter 10, it came to pass as they went that they entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. You see, in straightway, we're given a lot of information about who the character type of Martha was. She was a, a woman and a, and a family that was given to hospitality, a woman who loved to give and loved to share. And it says that he, he, she received him. To receive as a guest is what it means. See, Martha was honoured to have the Lord stay, and she received him into her house. And we're told in verse 39 that she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. It would appear on this occasion that Lazarus is either absent in the record, perhaps he wasn't there, or he was in the sidelines of the story, in the way that the record wants to portray the, the challenge between these two sisters. But more importantly, they, the, the record wants to demonstrate what was happening between these two ladies. And it came to pass, it says, she has a sister called Mary. And I want you to notice, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. She sat at his feet and heard his word. It's, it's actually an interesting expression. You see, when it says that, She's at the feet of Jesus. There are a number of disciples that were classified, or a number of people that sat at people's feet. Luke chapter 8, verse 35, Legion, when he was healed, was found sitting, listening at Jesus' feet in Luke chapter 8. Mary here in Luke chapter 10 sat at Jesus' feet. And it says of Paul, the apostle, when he was Saul, in Acts chapter 22, he says that he was brought up at the feet of Gamaliel. So being at the feet of someone was... Was, the, was 
uh, demonstration of being an earnest disciple and follower of the teacher. She sat eager to listen, to glean the teachings and message of Jesus and lapped up every syllable he uttered. She was right there underneath his feet to listen and to understand. And so to be seated and listening demonstrated that spirit of earnest discipleship that played out between the teacher and the student relationship. But I think there's something that's really important to read very carefully in the record because we need to read what verse 39 says carefully. It wasn't just Mary alone that sat at Jesus' feet. You see, it says in verse 19 that she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his words. And I think what we're being told, brothers and sisters and young people, is that not only did Martha receive him, the Lord Jesus Christ, into her house, but that she too with Mary sat at Jesus' feet initially. You see, Martha was also an eager disciple of the Lord, listening intently at his feet to understand and to listen to the Lord's teaching, hungry and thirsty for the Lord's words of wisdom and understanding. Martha wasn't just the simple, practical one uninterested in the Lord's teaching. No, she wasn't. She was, in fact, a faithful, earnest disciple of her Lord. And we'll see in the second class, when we look at Martha's faith, just how much she understood from the Lord's teachings, from the conviction of the law, and her understanding of the prophets around the subject of Christ's messiahship and the resurrection. She wasn't a numpty, brothers and sisters and young people. She sat at Jesus' feet with Mary. However, as the day wore on, as the meal approached, possibly the evening meal, we're not told, but Martha's mind in service turned to how she would feed her guests. A natural thing for the hostess and the owner of the house without Simon present. And soon, brothers and sisters, Martha was entirely preoccupied with the preparing of the meal. I want you to think about this, and the ladies amongst us that prepare those meals and the husbands that occasionally might help might understand these things. You see, bustling busily in the kitchen, Martha begins to juggle the heating of the wood-fired stove, the assembly of the pots, the getting out of all the pans, making sure she had all the ingredients as she endeavours now to cater for the numerous guests that were staying, running backwards and forwards to fetch supplies and water from outside. She soon, once the oven was working, began to feel the pressure of the preparation of this meal. And glancing over, she sees Mary seated, her eyes transfixed, her attention glued on her Lord as she listens intently to the gracious words that Jesus spake. You see, Martha initially most likely had tried to glean little snippets of the conversation to stay connected, but soon lost that as the potatoes began to boil over, as the broccoli began to burn, and as the lamb began to sizzle. And quickly became entirely distracted in the preparations of the meal, and slowly, as the temperature of the meal increased, so did Martha's blood pressure. You know, it's likely, brothers and sisters, when you stop and think about this, that Mary and Martha had discussed what would be required of the preparations of the meal. Don't you think? Who would help what? When it would have to be done? But now that the Lord was in full flight, Mary was nowhere to be seen, glued to her Lord as she begins to understand and appreciate and to love what he had to say. Meanwhile, Martha in the kitchen becomes irritated and Mary refuses to respond. Like, I, I don't know about you, but I like to picture the scene. I put yourself on the fly on the wall, right? I've seen this happen in different houses, including my own. Uh, when, you know, you think about this as this scene might play out, Martha initially, surreptitiously, tries to get Martha's attention. Right? Mary, initially not responding, possibly completely oblivious to, to Martha's growing mood. Martha tapping people on the shoulder to send a message. Can you just let Martha know I need, uh, Mary know I need her? And Martha finally looking back. Yeah, yeah. Five minutes. 
I'm making it making I'm making things up that aren't potentially in the record, but I, I could see this playing out between these two wonderful ladies. Martha coming back after three minutes, Mary not looking, deliberately, finally getting her attention, two more minutes. Martha beginning to gesture a little bit more violently than before, eyes speaking volumes, the head shaking, the eyebrows darkening in complete frustration and exasperation, huge sighs, the tongue clicking. Preparing the meal was a huge task and a responsibility just for one. Verse 40 says, but Martha was cumbered about with much serving. It's a huge job. You know, the idea of this idea of being cumbered about is this idea of being distracted or occupied or busy. It's the idea of employment. She was absolutely employed about much serving, much administration. You see, the, the comparison is being made between Mary who sat at Jesus' feet but, and, but Mary is the host, uh, sorry, Martha is the hostess who wants to be able to listen to the Lord but feels morally obligated to serve and thus occupied and entirely distracted by the meal preparations. And dinner never makes itself, does it? Unless you buy KFC. They didn't have KFC back in those days. So finally, this theme explodes from out of Martha's ears and this frustration boils over. And finally, I notice very carefully, in front of everybody, Martha marches forward. She interrupts the teaching of the Lord and look at what she does, brothers and sisters. She accuses the Lord of not caring and distracting Mary from helping her in the kitchen. Look what she says. Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. Bid her. I want you to speak to her. You tell her. Why? Because she's not listening to me. You tell her to come and help me. You know, the idea to come and help means to lay hold on or to help in obtaining you tell her to come and lend a hand. That's what she's actually asking of the Lord. It's incredible, isn't it, really? To think that Martha was so steamed up, uh, pun intended, she crosses the floor in front of everyone and accuses the Lord of not caring about her in the kitchen. That's what she does. It's remarkable, isn't it? How did Martha get so worked up? What was Martha's challenge? I think, brothers and sisters, Martha's challenge was a question about fairness and equality. You see, she had wanted to listen to Christ, but was sacrificing to serve. Martha felt that Mary should be doing the same. It wasn't fair. You see, Martha was struggling with why the Lord, who could see that she was running backwards and forwards in a complete flat, hadn't asked others to help, and why he hadn't sent Mary out to help her. She was having to serve alone. The Lord didn't seem to care that her sister sat at his feet doing nothing. And Martha's concern, brothers and sisters and young people, was self-centred. My sister has left me to serve alone, but her that she helped me. She's self-centered. To Martha, this issue was about fairness because to her, it didn't feel fair that she had to sacrifice to serve and her sister did not. And brothers and sisters, I'm going to ask a question. Have you ever felt like that in ecclesial life? That it doesn't feel fear that you're giving so much and there's so many other people that aren't giving and it's not fair. And if you haven't, brothers and sisters, you may be more like a Mary than a Martha. I can tell you the Marthas amongst us have felt this on many occasions. Looking around at the Marys amongst us, 
and thinking it's not fair. Am I right? I've certainly found the resentment, as I've seen. So I'm not alone at fault, I'm sure. You see, sacrificing in administration and service felt like you were giving a lot. It feels like you're sacrificing a lot. And when you look at others who aren't, you have a growing resentfulness towards others because it doesn't seem fair. You see, the martyrs amongst us will feel keenly their responsibilities to serve. The martyrs amongst us feel and see the jobs that need to be done, the food that needs to be preparing, the tables that need to be put out, the, the, the meals that need to be delivered onto those tables, the lawns that need to be mowed, the floor that needs to be vacuumed, the chairs that need to be moved, the mess that needs to be cleared away, the dishes that need to be done. The martyrs see all of those things, don't they, brothers and sisters? They see the jobs. They prepare to serve because they see that need and they prepare to sacrifice for others. But the problem is, brothers and sisters, is, is that when in our service we look around and see Mary sitting engaged in deep conversation and in our minds potentially doing nothing, the feeling of inequality and injustice can quickly build into resentment because it doesn't seem fair. Do they just not see the jobs that need to be done? Are they just completely ignoring them? Or is it just beneath them? What are they talking about that's so much more important than serving their brothers and sisters? You ever felt like that? Well, if you do, as I have, have a look at Christ's response, brothers and sisters. Verse 41. Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. By the way, the, Martha joins a list of long list, well, not actually a long list, a small list of disciples whom the Lord gently but firmly calls aside to teach valuable less individual lessons by calling their name out twice. I don't know who some of those people were. Simon Peter in Luke chapter 22. Simon, Simon. Satan has desired to sift you, sift you as, as um, wheat. But I've prayed for you. Luke 22, verse 31. Simon Peter had to have an individual lesson. The Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 9. Saul, Saul. It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. And here was Martha's turn, brothers and sisters. And look at the lesson he has for Martha. Thou art careful and thou art troubled about many things. But one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part that shall not be taken away from her. You're careful and troubled about many things. All right, you've seen, we've talked about that slide, so we'll, we'll move on. You're careful and troubled about many things. The idea of being careful is to be anxious, to have taken immense thought and immense care. You've planned a lot of this, Martha. You've, you're careful. You've, you've really thought about this. But Martha, you're disquieted. You're troubled. You're troubled in mind. And it comes from the Greek word for a tumult or being in a complete uproar. Martha, Martha, all your preparations and thoughtfulness have got you all so worked up and concerned about so many things. Martha, you're worried about your guests. You're worried about the food. You're worried about the inactivity of your sister. You're worried about missing out. You're all worked up and anxious about so many things. By the way, if you've got colored pencil, the thing that had worked her up most was her sister because we know that because the idea of the many things of verse 41 is exactly the same word of the much serving in verse 40. The many things that he refers to is the much serving of verse 40. So you're mostly worried about the things that are in front of you. Martha, I can see all the work and all the jobs, and you're seeing all of them that need to be done, and it's stressing you out. You've got so much going on. But here's the key. One thing is needful. One thing. You know, there's a remarkable contrast, isn't it? You're so busy about so many things, but there's one thing. That's needful. 
that's necessary or the thing of need. And often it's used in the, cons uh, the idea of this, the, the, um, the thing that is needful is used in the context more often of food than anything else. It's the basics to sustain life. There's only one thing that's important for life, math. And it comes from the Greek word to be, to be busy or to be employed. The idea of things being needful, to be employed about. And Mary has chosen the good part. Or well, the idea, the good, she's chosen to eat something or to partake of something. The idea of the word part is the Greek word to partake, a portion or a share. And I think, brothers and sisters, what Christ is actually saying to Martha is this. Martha, Martha, you've got so many pots on the boil in your oven and your stove, but there's only one course of food. This is not a seven-course decar station menu. This is one course of food that's needful for life. One course that's vital and paramount and so critically important that you have to be occupied and employed with, Martha. And you're so busy running here and there and doing so many things and so many courses of food, but there's one course that's critical, and Mary has chosen to partake that good and that beneficial cause. And Martha, it shall not be taken from her. It's Martha, says the Lord. It's all about choices and it's all about priorities. In all honesty, Martha, your seven-course decar station menu, meal can wait. Eating something that will last for a lifetime is going to be far more beneficial than eating food, isn't it, Martha? Mary's chosen to eat this, and it's immensely beneficial for her, and it won't be taken from her. No, I won't tell her that she has to leave and that she has to help me. So here's a question, brothers and sisters. Here's the fundamental question. If Mary had chosen the good part and was partaking in that, had Martha chosen the bad part? Does the Lord criticise Martha for prioritising her serving of her guests over not sitting to partake in the Lord's delivery of the bed of heaven and her food as disciples? knew not of? Is the Lord criticising Martha for not being at his feet? Well, maybe a better way to ask the question is the question of faith versus works. What was critical? If, Martha had if Mary had chosen the good part, had Martha chosen the wrong part by doing works? What takes precedent? Faith or works? I think the answer to that is to read very carefully. Because I think they're both critically important. But it comes down to the question of the attitude of mind with which they are both given. You see, Martha's request was that the Lord should tell Mary to come and assist her to serve and get the meal ready. That was the request of Martha. I want you to go and tell Mary to come and help me. Isn't that what the question was? However, I think the Lord's focus in trying to help Martha's understanding is to help Martha realize why Mary had prioritized the words of the Lord over service. And the food that would sustain Mary would not be taken from her because they were critical for her. You see, Martha's first lesson of this moment, at the end of the day, there is only one thing that is fundamental for life itself and for life eternal. And in the question of priorities, the things of the spirit will always trump the things of natural need. Priorities should always be skewed to ensure that spiritual development is paramount and prioritized. 
For these can save and sustain much more than any natural thing can. I think what the Lord says to Martha is he says, what's your priorities, Martha? Your issue starts with the fact that you wanted to do so much in your service. You wanted to give. You prepared so much for this thing. You're coming about with much serving. You're, you've planned this meal. You're coming about, you're, you're careful and troubled about many things. But remember, Martha, focus on what is needful and everything else can come next. Isn't that the message of Christ in Matthew chapter 6? Take no anxious thought, he says in verse 31 of Matthew 6. For what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. There's your key expressions. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be, ever, uh, shall be added unto you. Matthew 6, 31 to 33. If we're ever in any doubt as to what should take priority, then this surely is the test, isn't it? Is it mission critical for life eternal? If yes, prioritize them first. And for Martha, that was the first thing that she had to try and realize and grapple with is you can serve Martha, but if it becomes this huge, great big thing, that means that you are so worried about it and you're so concerned about it that it takes priority in your life. And it's probably out of balance. That was the first lesson that Martha had to learn. But I think there's another lesson that Martha had to understand. And it's something for the Marthas amongst us to realize. I want you to notice very carefully that Martha is never criticized for serving. Nor is she criticized or reprimanded for being cumbered about. Christ just made an observation. You are careful and troubled about many things. There was no judgment in that statement. Just as an observation, you're distracted from listening. And while she was busy, she was focused, but she wanted, she was focused on her meal, but she wanted to be at the Lord's feet, but she had been sacrificing that opportunity to serve. She's not criticized by the Lord for that. Instead, he focuses more on the priorities that Mary had chosen. Now, that's really important. He doesn't focus on what Martha's chosen to do, but on what Mary had chosen to do. Why? What was the issue that Martha had to understand? Well, the point was, is that Martha, I understand that you have sacrificed to serve, but Mary has prioritized in her mind the thing that is beneficial for her. And it's not going to be taken from her. Martha, you can't just demand that others prioritize things the same way as you do. Just because service is the way that you see how to give and just because it's important for you, you can't demand that others see it the same way and prioritize the same as you. It doesn't work like that. Others have differing needs. Others require different things. Others will prioritize differently. They may choose other good parts to partake in that may not be aligned to your priorities. Priorities. Don't judge them just because they don't serve like you because they don't see the priorities that you see. You see, the way that the Lord is working with Martha. You know, I think it's interesting because the Lord knew what lay in store for this family in a matter of weeks. You see, these two sisters were going to be tested to the core. They were both about to lose their beloved brother. And one of them was going to be able to hold it together, whilst the other one was going to fall apart entirely. And the Lord knew, perhaps on this occasion, just why Mary needed to be at his feet and why Martha didn't understand. See, I think perhaps the Lord knew the ultimate need to help Mary through the difficult moments and to try and provide some reassurance in education to help her as she grapples 
in a matter of weeks with the loss of her beloved brother. Martha had no idea, but perhaps the Lord did. But Martha, therefore, you can't judge them because they don't serve like you. You don't know just what's going on in their life. And this, brothers and sisters, I believe is one of the, la- the greatest lessons that Martha's life, the reason I believe this family and the story is recorded because here captured in this little house in Bethany is a, is a scene that has caused and continues to cause much tension and challenge in ecclesial life, doesn't it? You see, we have many representations in our ecclesia of, of these two wonderful and remarkable women. Each find their way to dedicate their lives to the truth and their lives to the Lord. But who each give wholeheartedly in different ways. Each hold their strengths. But each have valuable lessons to learn. And particularly from each other. And it's no different for us in our ecclesial life. We all have to learn from each other. To understand each other. In order to grow and to develop each other to the kingdom. So what lessons can we learn from these wonderful ladies. Well, I think the lesson for Martha or for the Marthas amongst us is not to stop giving, but to prioritize the things that perhaps are more needful. In focusing on what is needful, we shouldn't stop to give or stop to serve. This is the way that Martha's show their love for the Lord and for his brethren, and it's important that that continues. But it shouldn't be so big and so dominating that it comes at the expense of the things that are spiritually critical for eternal life. Should. And for Martha, that was something she had to understand. And in serving, the lessons for Martha's amongst us is that we have to learn to serve in singleness of mind, without judgment. You see, it's easy to see the service of others or the lack of thereof through the lens of our own perspective on life, isn't it? It's easy to measure others against our own set of priorities and our own tasks, evaluating what we think is important and how much we're sacrificing and what they're not doing. We can't do that, brothers and sisters. This yardstick and measure is a judgmental and harmful measurement, isn't it? And it will in no wise assist our own spiritual development, nor these. We have no idea necessarily, do we, of the spiritual needs of others and judging them as a self-centered, egotistical and self-serving process. And not to be entertained. Our role and responsibility is to serve in singleness of mind with a pure heart, as Colossians 3 verse 23 says. Whatsoever we do, Do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto man. Colossians 3, verse 23. And so for Martha's, we have to give, not to stop giving, but to focus on what is needful and to serve with a pure heart. Because that is the way we give. What are the lessons perhaps for the Marys amongst us? Well, I think the first thing for Marys is that the first lesson is be mindful of the way in which the Marthas serve. You see, as a Mary, we will always naturally choose to sit at Jesus' feet every time. It's, it's not even an option for Mary. It's what she was going to do. It was a default position. She must hear. She must listen. She must absorb as much as she can the words of the Lord. And for Mary, it was natural that she would always seek and be absorbed in this. And we're going to find Mary always at the Lord's feet, except for the time she falls apart. But for Mary's, it's helpful if we take a moment to consider Martha's. You see, Martha's will naturally see the jobs, the responsibilities, the things that need to be done. She will naturally sacrifice in these moments, even though she might want to be there to, at the feet of of the Lord to serve the needs of others. She will naturally go there. And so for Mary's, it's important to be sensitive to this, to talk to Martha's, perhaps beforehand, to seek to assist in times where you can to ease the burden and to show Martha your love by sacrificing sometimes when you feel you can and where you feel you should. 
But the other thing that's important for Martha is to be sensitive to a Martha. She will naturally probably drive a bit bigger than what it needs to be. But she will be doing so because she is sacrificing to serve. So if need be, we have to encourage to check the priorities, to carefully and lovingly do that. But to not take her sacrifice for granted because she's <laughs> serving because that's the way she loves to give to her Lord. Dear brothers and sisters, when this balance is fully understood in ecclesial life, perhaps we can see the wonderful perfection of this family and of the balance between faith and works perfectly mixed because we're going to see this in John chapter 12. In conclusion, I want you to come and have a look in John chapter 12 because here is the perfect balance of the day in which Martha can serve in singleness of mind and Mary can give in service to her Lord and Lazarus can be amongst them. Look what it says in John chapter 12 and verse 1. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, which had been dead, and who he had raised from the dead. And there they made him a supper. And Martha served, brothers and sisters. No issues with that. But she's giving here. And Lazarus is there at the table with him, partaking in the meal. And Mary, well, she's at the feet of Jesus again, but anointing him with the ointment of spikenard, so that the house is filled with the odour of her love. You see, here we can find that Martha can serve without judgment, without remorse, willingly, thankfully, in appreciation for all her Lord had done. And Mary can operate at Jesus' feet in no concern or no judgment. So, brothers and sisters, let's endeavor to learn from this wonderful family and to gain the strength and encouragement and exhortation to work as our ecclesial family in the service of our Lord.